everything is created by Allah as Allah says Allah khaliqu kulli shay wa huwa ala kulli shay'in wakil Allah created all things and is the agent on which all things depend so uh, we're talking about on one from one perspective that creation all uh, is from Allah that nothing takes place in the universe in creation which is not by his permission as the Prophet ﷺ used to often repeat in du'as لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله this is an expression of that same concept لا حول meaning there is no movement ولا قوة and there is no power إلا بالله except by Allah's will this is the basic concept. Uh, Prophet ﷺ also stressed it uh, in another hadith, well-known hadith, in which he said, Be aware that if the whole wor- world gathered together in order to do something to help you, they would not be able to do anything for you which Allah had not already written for you. Likewise, if the whole of the world gathered together to try to harm you, they would not be able to harm you except by something which Allah had already written would harm you. So this is the basic uh, concept that nothing takes place without Allah's permission. Now what is included in that is the concept of good and evil in the world. And this is where uh, we have an, uh, an area of understanding which is very important where people have deviated, gone astray, uh, misunderstood uh, purposes of creation over the issue of evil within Allah's creation. You know, as commonly expressed by atheists uh, to people who believe in God, if God is all powerful and God is good, then where did the evil come from? This is the question. The fact that there is evil, that to them means there can't possibly be a God. That becomes a line of argument, a common line of argument used by the atheists. So very important for us to understand how do we deal with that type of of concept. You know, where does the evil come from? Because we said Allah created everything. It means that the evil ultimately is from Allah. And we, we don't need to shy away from it. Those people who had difficulty in dealing with this concept, you had the Zoroastrians. The, what they refer to as the fire worshippers of, of Iran. Uh, what they did in their inability to grasp this concept that evil could come from a good God, they attributed evil to another God. So they had instead two gods. Ahura Mazda, who was the god of good, and Angra Manu, who was the god of evil. Right? Although in their system the God of good is going to win out in the end and he is symbolized by the fire, the eternal fire and the God of evil is darkness right? so, so the light will win over the darkness so he, the God of good is the ultimate God but still they, they did not want to attribute evil to God so they had to really in what they're doing is they've elevated Satan to the level of a God who is able to create evil without Allah's permission and this is error this is error what we are, how do we understand this then where did the evil come from we say yes the evil came from Allah but the reality is that Allah did not create anything which is purely evil that whatever we perceive as evil in Allah's creation there is a good side to it that we are able to see eventually or we may never see until after Yawm al you know we don't necessarily have to see the good side to recognize that there is a good side and that when Allah created things in which there is evil He didn't create them for the evil but for the good which would come from the evil These are two important concepts for us to grasp in terms of the creation of evil. And Allah, when you you look in the Quran or in the Sunnah, you will not find that Allah attributes evil directly to Himself. 
When he speaks about the creation of evil, he will talk about the evil of his creation. As in Surah Al-Falaq, where he says, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقِ Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the dawn from the evil that he has that min shari ma khala from the evil from what he has created from the evil of what he has created he didn't say from his evil but from the evil of what he has created and this is the correct uh, we could say etiquette in dealing with Allah with relationship to evil we don't focus that Allah created the evil the evil in your life is from God and no no yes it is a part of Allah's creation, but there is a good element to it. We focus on the good as opposed to the evil element. This is the correct uh, way of looking at it. And I should just mention that in the course of my presentation, I will mention certain verses from the Quran, etc. That uh, I know in some um, circles, it is common to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, before quoting. But actually, this is not from the Sunnah. Prophet you will find many hadiths in which he talks about something, he brings a verse from the Quran, he doesn't say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, he doesn't say, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, because that is only when you are reading Quran. When you sit down to read the Quran, you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. And if you are beginning at a surah which begins with Bismillah, then you can say, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. But it is not a requirement in the course of a conversation or a presentation, etc. You're mentioning a piece of a verse or a verse that you must go through that. Right? So just to clarify in case some of you might be wondering, well, why isn't he saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem? Okay? So, what we're talking about here then, is that Allah, in creating certain things in this world, in which... Uh, there is evil, we can see evil in it. The intent behind that creation is not for that evil, but from the good which would come from the evil. And we, in our personal lives, function using the same principle. In that, one will go to a doctor, uh, because you're going to travel someplace, and they tell you this is an area where there are certain diseases, so you should get, you know, vaccination, and you allow that doctor to stick a needle in your arm right we could say as a if we looked at the, the the sticking of a needle in your arm by itself we say this is evil if somebody came up to you and said listen can I stick this needle in your arm you say no <laughs> no, no thank you right I'm not a masochist I don't love pain you know so I'm not going to you know encourage people to go sticking needles in me right but if in sticking that needle, whether it's through acupuncture or it's through vaccination, there is good which comes out of it, then I will subject myself. So you'll see people, you know, doing acupuncture, you see they have needles all over their heads and their backs and their arms and, you know, and you look at this and say, wow, you know, something, normally you would not welcome this. But because of the fact that it has been shown to produce, you know, relief from certain pains and things like this, people subject themselves to it. So they're doing this for the good which comes from it, not from the evil which is directly involved in that, attaining that good. Similarly, people question, if Allah knew before He created Adam and Iblis, that Iblis would refuse to bow to, to Adam, that Adam would eat from the tree because of Iblis' uh, trickery, so why did he create Iblis? Huh? He could have created Adam, left Iblis out of the picture, and we just have things are in order, no problems, no... So why? The point is that when Allah created uh, Iblis, the evil which came from Iblis, it produced a great good. If we look at Iblis and Adam, both of them disobeyed Allah. Adam disobeyed Allah and ate from the tree. Iblis disobeyed Allah and didn't bow in honor before Adam. Some people mistakenly understood or understand that Iblis' refusal to bow 
is what made him a kafir. But this is not true. This is not true. Because if in Iblis' act of disobedience is kufr, what do we say of Adam? Did he not disobey also? So you'd have to say Adam became a kafir also. No. Disobedience in and of itself does not cause a person to become a disbeliever. The Khawarij, the group which broke away from the early body of Islam, that was the position they took. If you made any act of disobedience, you became a disbeliever. Finish. This is a, this is a deviation. This is an aberration. This is not the correct Islamic understanding. Sin does not make a person a disbeliever. The point is that when Adam disobeyed Allah, and Allah had taught him words of repentance, he turned back to Allah in repentance. In the case of Iblis, when he disobeyed Allah, and Allah called him upon it, what did he do? Did he turn to Allah in repentance? No. He said, I am better than him. I'm better than Adam. You made me from fire and you made him from clay. This is where the disbelief came. Because what in fact he was saying was that it was not befitting for me to bow before Adam because I am superior to him. And the fact that you are telling me to bow before him in, indicates that you are wrong. Because his disbelief, he's saying, Allah, God, you are wrong in telling me to bow before this who that is inferior to me. It should be bowing before me. This is where now the disbelief comes into play. He's attributing to Allah error. This is a statement of disbelief. Anybody who says Allah made a mistake here, that's a statement of disbelief. This is where the disbelief came. So the point is though, Adam disbelieved, uh, disobeyed Allah, Iblis disobeyed Allah, fell into disbelief. He came and he tricked Adam into disobeying Allah. And when he did so, Adam turned back to Allah in repentance. The turning back to Allah in repentance is one of the greatest acts of worship. Isn't it? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said what? Kullu bani Adam khatta. All of Adam's descendants constantly commit errors. Wa khayr al-khatta'een at-tawwabun. And the best of those who constantly err are those who constantly turn back to Allah in repentance. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was also quoted in Sahih Muslim as saying, if you didn't commit sins, and turn back to Allah in repentance, Allah would have removed you from the face of the earth, brought another people who would commit sins, and turn back to Allah in repentance, and He would forgive them. So, the act of turning to Allah in repentance, this is a great act of worship. So much so, that Prophet Muhammad said, At-ta'ibu min al-dhambi kaman la dhambala one who repents from sin is like one without sin. This is how great. Furthermore, when Adam turned to Allah in repentance, then Allah forgave him. This manifestation of Allah's attribute of forgiveness, this great mercy, this came about because of Adam's disobedience and turning back to Allah in repentance. So all of this great good, because of course, to receive Allah's forgiveness and His mercy and His blessings, this is a great, great uh, benefit. So that great benefit, that great act of worship, this took place because of Iblis' trickery. So the creation of Iblis was not for the trick but for the good which came from his trick. Is that clear? Right? So when we look at the concept of good and evil in the world we recognize that good everything that Allah creates ultimately is good. 
That the evil that we perceive in the world is not pure evil. If there is relative pure evil, it is that which comes from human beings and the jinn. Where a human being intends evil and he or she tries to implement that evil. This we can call relatively pure evil. Allah's intent is good. The act that we may see or the incident we may see may appear to us to be evil, but there is good behind it. Sometimes the good becomes very evident to us. Something happens to us and we say, oh wow, you know, why did that happen so and so? And then a day later, a few days later, we say, oh, we can see the good. That was really for this positive good thing. And other times, it happens and we don't see the good. Time passes, we never see it. And this is what is in the lesson of Musa and Khidr. The lesson of Musa and Khidr in Surah Al-Kahf, this is what is in that story. Now some people mistakenly have taken from the story of Musa and Khidr that what we should learn from that is that we should follow our sheikhs, our peers, our spiritual guides and leaders without question. This is what, they have an element that tries to promote this understanding. That's how we should be with our peer, our sheikh. Right? And the example that they give commonly is that the murid or the follower should be with his sheikh like the dead body in the hands of those who are washing the body. You know? The dead body it has no will. The people washing the body turn it, they wash this side, they turn the other side, they wash it. That we should be with our sheikh like the dead body in the hands of those who are washing the body. But this is a mistaken understanding. Because neither is our sheikh or our peer or whatever equivalent to Khidr. Khidr who was receiving revelation from Allah. Nor are we equivalent to Prophet Musa, a prophet of Allah. So that analogy is totally irrelevant, is totally in error. That's the wrong analysis from it. The correct analysis is that behind calamities is good. The breaking of the boat, of course, when Khidr broke the boat, the boat started to sink. The owner of the boat would have said, why? Khidr, why did you do this? Just like Musa said, why did you do this? You know, he would have felt very bad, his boat is broken. But then, the king came down the river and was snatching everybody's boat, didn't take his boat because it was damaged. He said, ah, alhamdulillah, mashallah. He could see the end results right away, shortly thereafter. The other example of killing of the boy. Right? Relative to the parents of that boy, their child was murdered. Huh? Khidr murdered the boy. That's what they could see. They could see their child was murdered. Of course, Khidr informed us, informed Musa, and informed us that based on revelation from Allah, he knew, that, and based on Allah's instructions, he knew that that boy was going to grow up. His parents were righteous. And that boy was going to grow up and be a fitna for the parents to such a degree that they would have themselves fallen into kufr. So to protect them from the evil of the boy, which wasn't as evident at the time, he was only 10 or 12 years old. I mean, what was to come, you couldn't see it. He was just an innocent child. Allah took his life. Now for the parents, of course, Allah gave them another child, a girl. And this girl was righteous. And of course they would have appreciated their daughter. But they would have remained in their hearts until they died a sadness for the loss of their son. Isn't it? Their murdered son. They would still feel that loss. But of course on the day of judgment, when Allah judges things and explains to them, then they will realize that that loss, that which they thought was a loss, was a gain. You see? And that's 
the difference between the two that is, comes out of that story the story of Musa and Khidr that there are certain things which will happen in our lives we may have difficulty in understanding what is the rhyme and the reason behind these things we can't see any so the tendency for us is to say this is bad and you know why Allah why did you do this we start to question Allah and this is if you listen to the atheists the leading atheists people like Hawkins right Jay Hawkins you know the leading physicist who is all time atheist written books on time and how the world has no beginning etc if you listen to him in the midst of all his atheist claims and statements you will hear this little voice crying out saying why am I like this because he is a quadriplegic in a wheelchair twisted he can't even hardly speak and this happened to him in his 20s he was fine he grew up a young person then he had this debilitating disease which reduced him to a cripple being pushed around in a wheelchair he has this massive brain but physically he is in the worst of shape so in what he, you hear the crying out from him is God why did you do this to me if there is a God there, there, there is no reason for this to have been done to me this is unfair there are so many other people in the world he visited India he saw all these a billion Indians there the vast majority of them are not contributing what he is contributing as far as he sees it but they're healthy and here is he with all this knowledge and he's benefiting humankind and he's in this shape why? why me? there can't possibly be a God because of his inability to deal with tragedy calamity he cannot understand the good behind it so therefore he ends up denying God's existence and this is common if you listen to most of the people who disbelieve who did that, deny God's existence usually you'll hear this in their statements I had a aunt when I was eight years old you know she was such a nice aunt she was so kind to us then she had a car accident and died why what did she do to deserve that you see from that comes disbelief in God so the principle of rububiyah understanding the creation the creation of everything which exists this gives us the foundation for understanding tragedy in life to be able to recognize that there is good behind it all even though we may not be able to perceive it so this out of this comes obviously uh, trust in God you know once one has that knowledge to realize that behind all of these things is good then we are able to put our trust in God whatever happens in our lives we realize that he is the one who controls it all and it is ultimately for our benefit the other point which comes out of recognizing Allah's dominion over all things that he is the creator and sustainer of everything is that there is no room in this understanding of Allah for amulets and charms and omens and all these other things connected that people commonly depend on to protect them from evil and to bring good to them right and this includes all of the arms the charms and amulets whether a person uses a stone or a flower or four-leaf clover or a rabbit's foot or whatever they use or they use the Quran where they produce a Quran which is one inch by one inch you know not intended for reading because you must have a microscope to be able to read what is written on the pages so they didn't intend reading but so that it will be put in a locket worn around your neck hung in your car you know or whatever in order to bring barakah to protect you from evil this is also in the category of 
amulets and charms. And the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk. Whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk. And he stated that on a circumstance where he was giving, taking the oath of allegiance from a group of uh, the companions and he took it from, a, from everybody except one individual. And so they asked him, why didn't you take the oath from this individual? He said, because he's wearing a charm. At that point he went inside of his cloak, took it out, tore it and threw it. Then he took the oath of allegiance from him and he said, whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk. So this is a general statement which covers all forms of amulets. So basically, when we speak of Tawheed of Rububiyyah, we're talking about Allah's dominion over all things. Nothing takes place in the creation except by His permission. Whatever we perceive as being evil, there is good behind it. It is a part and parcel of Allah's creation.